we have a, um, a low fidelity teaching model that we use in anatomy to teach um, a little bit about the topography and the organs in the GI tract. So we would have the representation of the tongue, esophagus, stomach, and then we have the pancreas here, both lobes with the duodenum starting. And then um, we have the students build the root of the mesentery and insert it um, through the board so that they can understand um, how everything relates to the root of the mesentery. So um, we would have from the duodenum, you would have jejunum, jejunum, jejunum. And then we would have the ilium right here with the cecum. And then we would have the transverse colon and then uh, out through the rectum. And then this model is scalable or buildable. So we have other organs that we put on it um, to include the liver and the spleen and the omentum. Um, and then we talk about uh, surgical context, like what happens in a GDB and rotation with that so they can rotate um, and uh, correct it. And um, we have lots of discussions and active learning around this model. So this is an IV model that we made that you can use for either administering medications, withdrawing uh, blood or to insert uh, an IV catheter. And I've made it um, around a 3D printed limb with a plastic poured paw so that it fe feels realistic. So the students actually have to, to restrain the paw um, adequately. And then underneath it is an operation board game um, circuit board so that when you complete the circuit, so I have a needle and syringe here and a little spring. So if you insert this through the spring and then go to withdraw blood. So I have blood here circulating through the system. It's not, it's just, it's fake blood. Um, if I go in and I get into the vein, I should get positive feedback. So you can see here there's red in here because I've got that positive feedback. And then if I was to go through the vein all the way through, it sets the buzzer off. And so that's the negative feedback the students would get. This is the last model that they used before practicing on a live animal in the junior surgery course, because that buzzer is just enough of a jump to cause them to remember that no matter what happens, they have to keep a hold of the limb and stay cautious with their sharp um, so that they hopefully just move with the animal instead of react in a, a manner we don't want. So this is a... Uh replica of a canine abdomen. So we use it to have the, stu the students discuss the um, anatomy, the surgical landmarks that they would use. So we have a surgical pen that then they can draw where their incision would be roughly. And then we have cool things that we can add to it. This is a chemical that will change, um, that will glow under a black light. So I put it on half here. Normally we can put it on the whole thing. Um, and then they do a surgical scrub. Um, so they can do a rough prep first, um, and then they can do a sterile prep, which means they can open glove, um, and then they can um, even drape this, this model, and a lot of times we will also put it on top of the spay model so that they can do the whole procedure using this, um, like working in, in a cavity through the hole. So this is an equine uh, foot model that I've made. Um, that we use primarily to teach anatomy at this stage, but it can be used for other things such as teaching how to do nerve blocks of the distal limb as well as um, taking pulse points and things like that. So the students will get it um, all assembled like this and then as part of the active learning they will take it apart piece by piece and name identify all the parts and then they will build it again and as they rebuild it they start to talk about what the the structure and function of each of the tissues is as they assemble it so in this case we have arteries veins and nerves in place as well as the lateral cartilages and we have all three of the distal bones of the the horse's foot um, and then we start to build on top of that so we have the deep digital flexor and the superficial digital flexor that get added on to the back side of the hoof. And then on the front, we have the either common or long digital extensor that gets added on. Rubber band, which acts as the retinaculum in place. Then we add the digital cushion in the back underneath. Add that to the, what we call the corium, 
And then we put that into the hoof itself. And it's that simple. And then we can have conversations about um, the structure and function of everything, including um, how a horse lands and then breaks over and all of the structure and function associated with that. So this is a skeleton that we bought commercially available and then we've tricked it out. So on the skeleton's right side, we have painted all of the significant and or palpable bony landmarks so that they can identify those. And we have a, a key that corresponds to all of those colors. And then if I spin this around, on this side, we have all of the significant muscular attachments color coded as well. So you can see the proximal and distal attachments. And then we have active learning labs where the students will, um, these are fully articulated. So the students will um, go through and discuss those attachment points and then they will try to predict what will happen across the joints that those muscles um, will span. And then we will have them hook up um, little elastic bands between points where those muscles attach and see if their predictions are accurate. And then we have discussions as to like agonists of movement at that same joint versus antagonists of movement at that same joint. And then what muscles are, are what we call anti-gravity muscles, which stop them from collapsing. Um, we also have other things that we do with these skeletons. For instance, there is a synthetic um, pleural cavity here with a heart and lungs. And so then we talk about doing thoracocentesis or a chest tap and then pericardial centesis and a um, pericardial tap. And so all of this clear plastic is to simulate the serous membranes um, of the peritoneum. And we have discussions then anatomically about that as well as the skills involved um, in those procedures. So this is a commercially bought skeleton but we've cut felt to be the exact shape and size of the muscles that would be appropriate for this size dog. Um, and then we have basically applied rubber cement to the areas of attachment on the skeleton itself and let it dry, as well as the parts of the, the muscle that would attach. Um, those have rubber cement on them as well so that when they come into contact with one another, um, they stick. And so the students then will build this from the inside out, sticking the um, attachments of each muscle. Um, these are the extrinsic muscles, so muscles that go from the main body or the axillary skeleton to the appendicular ske skeleton or the limb, so from the main body to the limb. These are what supports it. And so as they build these muscles from close to the body wall out, they can see how the limb is supported and how each muscle would potentially act when it contracts to pull on that limb. And then we can have discussions about clinical context, um, about a forelimb amputation, and that each of these would have to be cut in some way to get the limb off of the animal. So these are just two examples of the new dogs we have to use for training in the clinical skills lab. Um, we have cats as well, and then all sizes of dogs, different breeds. And we use them to teach physical exams and restraint. So for instance, this is a very big dog. Um, and so we would have the students get down on the ground and it depends on what we would want to restrain them for. But if we were gonna do something like a blood draw, we could have them get down and practice the different ways that they would restrain for physical exam. They could look at the ears, do a, start to do an oral exam and go down so that they can practice. And then for um, this dog that's standing, we can have them work either alone or in pairs to be able to get in underneath and then roll them down and hold them, whoops, hold them um, for a blood draw or different parts of the physical exam. So there's lots of ways that we use these, these dogs as, far, as part of our teaching. This is our endoscopy simulator and we use this for the students to get a taste of some of the advanced procedures that we can offer now in veterinary medicine. So that helps us in a number of different ways. Number one, it might inspire a student to pursue specialization. We are desperately in need of more specialists in internal medicine in particular in vet med. And number two, it helps students better understand what they might be referring pets for when they send a pet to UW Veterinary Care for endoscopy in the future. Um, it's also just a fun way for them to better experience all of the different technology that we're afforded. And every year things become more affordable for general practice vets too. So there are many practices now that also have this endoscopy equipment available and this can be their first exposure to it. This is actually the exact same machine that human gastroenterologists learn to train and 
to do their procedures on. It's nice because it's gamified. So there are modules that are simple, like grabbing a basketball and putting it into a hoop and popping balloons. And then there are other modules that are actually made to look like a colonoscopy or an upper GI endoscopy, which is great because it means then that we can teach learners how to handle the scope in a low stakes, low stress environment that makes them very proficient when they actually move on to real life patients. So this is our laparoscopy simulator and we use this to train learners who might be training in surgery or internal medicine or general practice to become familiar with the hand-eye screen coordination that's necessary for doing laparoscopic procedures. So this is to be able to say, you know, I'm watching what's happening on this screen and I'm able to translate it to what I'm doing with these tools inside the abdomen. And that's a learned skill that um, takes practice to kind of hone in on. And so we do this by moving around fun little figures like these dinosaurs, by stacking up these various different shapes and colors that we have here, and just practicing moving them around the boards. So this tends to be a really low stakes way for learners to practice these skills and make sure that by the time they move on to doing this in a body cavity, they feel really confident and really comfortable with things. And because it's gamified, they'll want to keep practicing and improve their skills.